Um, welcome everybody to this um, webinar about health promotion for girls where we're focusing on gender transformative and other promising approaches um, for facilitators of girls programs. And I'm really excited um, today to have a co-presenter with the Girls Action Foundation um, with me. Do you want to say, introduce yourself, Marbella? Sure, absolutely. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. This is Marbella Carlos, the project officer here at Girls Action Foundation in Montreal. That's great. And um, the other um, person I just want to acknowledge is um, <clears throat> Tasman Nathu from the Center of Excellence, who has really been instrumental in organizing the slides um, for us today and the thinking about girls programming over a number of projects that we'll be talking about in a moment. So a little overview about what we're going to be covering today. Um, we're going to do a little bit of background, so context for health promotion with girls. Be a little bit more clear about what exactly is health promotion, show you some statistics on girls' health, physical activity, substance use, use and healthy eating. Um, and then we're going to do um, discussion and questions, working with girls, principles for practice. Uh, um, so it's going to be harm reduction oriented, trauma informed, gender transformative. What exactly does gender transformative mean? And uh, culturally safe. And then we're going to be talking about facilitating girl specific health promotion. So what do we mean by doing actual girl specific groups and why that's important? So um, all throughout, you're welcome to type into the chat box if you have any questions or anything you'd like to add or need clarification. And we already have some, we also have some people on standby if you have any technical issues. So feel free to chat with any of us uh, in the little chat box on the right throughout the presentation. Thanks a lot, um, Marbella. So um, yeah, the Q&A we'll be keeping an eye on as we go along. Um, just a quick slide on our two organizations who've been working together um, for some time now on uh, girls' health promotion issues. And um, please, you know, feel free to explore more about what we've been doing at our, um, our various uh, websites. But, you know, in terms of the projects we've been working on together, on the left-hand side there, that um, piece about girls' perspectives on girls' groups and healthy living and how girls' groups uh, can promote health, those two pieces came out of a research project we did together and with many of the other centers of excellence uh, for women's health that were in place um, back um, in 2011 or so. And um, these documents can be seen on, uh, on our websites and downloaded, and we'll be drawing from a lot of the ideas from that research project today. In the center are three um, documents we've built over time and updated over time. Um, again, focus on supporting uh, facilitators to have some resources and ideas for talking about the intersection between various um, issues such as physical activity and culture, smoking and stress, alcohol and depression, and et cetera. The main point being, I guess, as we've been building these resources together is that we're always asked to be talking about them more than one thing at a time and, uh, and to be comfortable with that complexity. And um, the final sheet here is a sheet um, about from Girls Action on, girl, on uh, healthy living overall that arose out of these projects that again talks about, you know, knowledge alone not being enough and conveying that, but really creating safe spaces for girls to be able to talk about health issues um, together and to um, learn, learn more um, together. So, you know, here's a little, you know, quick view of some of the things that girls said um, in the earlier research and uh, about how important girls' groups were in that, you know, role of helping them to freely share what they were experiencing, um, giving them a safe space to uh, talk, including a culturally safe uh, space and to learn um, new coping and decision-making skills and do 
you know, for us to create the space for critical thinking to happen, and that's a lot of what we'll be talking about today. Um, we, we identified from the literature back in the earlier project nine promising practices. We're only going to talk about four today, um, but we really wanted to acknowledge that um, uh, that you know, materials available and that we've been working together with funding from the Public Health Agency of Canada um, to develop a workshop guide which has been piloted and evaluated and that we're just fine-tuning that will be available um, in the fall and we'll do a second webinar that walks people through that workshop uh, guide uh, specifically. But again, aimed at you as girls group facilitators and health promoters um, to um, support you in your practice. So we're just going to do a little bit of um, background uh, context here, um, and I think you know it's, it's always good for us to to come back to this idea of health as more than um, not being ill and health promotion as really being about enabling people to increase control over and to um, improve their health. And, uh, you know, that I think is the essence of us trying to weave in health promotion work within um, the kinds of groups that Girls Action uh, Foundation has been linking and supporting over the years. And of course, it, you know, health promotion involves a lot more than the work we do in girls' groups. It, you know, it's a lot about supportive environments and community action as well as uh, personal skills. And it's also about reorienting health services so that, you know, there's more about prevention and health promotion built into our, um, our health care systems overall. So, you know, great tradition in Canada from the Charter on in thinking through some of these things. Um, this slide has a couple of things, one from the World Health Organization and one from the Canada Armed Forces, actually, that reinforce this idea that there's a lot of things we need to be um, healthy. And you'll see in the core determinants of health thing from the Canadian Armed Forces, which is beautifully colored, I think, that gender in the navy blue there is a key determinant of health, as well as many other things that you'll recognize around that circle. And I guess our thinking is that gender is often ignored or not integrated in uh, good ways within the context of health promotion work. And um, that's what we're here uh, to talk about today. Yeah, so like what Nancy was saying, why is it important to do girl-specific or gender-specific health promotion? And here we have um, a little quote for the rationale of girl-specific programming from our Amplify manual, which I'm going to talk about a little bit closer to the end of the webinar. Um, and it says, girls and young women encounter unique social, political, and economic issues in their everyday lives. Um, and I think that it's important for all of us to understand that there are gender-specific concerns that young women and girls encounter and these are things that you can't ignore when looking at it through a health promotion lens or when you're thinking about providing um, a health promotion workshop. Thanks. So um, I'm going to turn to offer a couple of slides of background about three girls' health issues, physical activity, substance use, and healthy eating, before we turn to the principles for practice for facilitators, including the gender transformative ones. Just because I think it's always important to start with um, uh, some of the issues that we want to be able to incorporate into um, the girls' groups. So here's a quick glance at some of the things we know about girls and physical activity that, you know, a very small percentage of girls aged 12 to 17 met the current physical activity guideline of at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous of physical activity daily, and you can see that from Stats Canada. And um, also, you know, the importance of girls participating in sports early um, so that the likelihood of them continuing will, um, will be in place. 
And, you know, we owe so much of our wisdom about physical activity in girls from the work of the Canadian Association for the Advancement of Women in Sports and Physical Activity, or CAUSE, to make it a lot easier, since it's such a big mouthful <laughs> otherwise. Um, but you can see um, both from their website um, that some things that encourage girls to engage in physical activity are enjoyment and perceived competence and self-efficacy and um, the positive physical self-perceptions um, they get from that. So, you know, weaving that into girls' group work is really uh, important. Now, as many of you know, um, we at the Center of Excellence in Vancouver have done lots of work on girls and substance use and are really, um, I guess, concerned about um, the age in which girls are starting to drink and, um, you know, really also about the most recent literature from, or the most recent data from Kaihai around um, the alcohol-related hospitalization rates for girls being even higher than boys and at very high rates. So clearly girls are starting to drink early and some of that drinking is um, really risky. And so we see, you know, again, girls groups as a really a great place to begin discussion about uh, substance use and um, that idea of knowledge plus resources plus support um, leading to healthy choices, I think is a great one in the girls action um, infographic there. And we've written a fair bit around girls, alcohol, and pregnancy um, and the prevention of um, fetal alcohol uh, spectrum disorder that um, is on the Center of Excellence site as well. And um, the healthy eating part, um, I think, is another really important um, piece around, you know, 48% of girls age 12 to 19 reported eating fruits and vegetables, the minimum recommended five or more times a day in the, again, from Stats Canada. And again, concern about hospitalization rates for eating disorder for um, females, 15 times that for males. Um, so, and the issue of food insecurity also being an important one. Um, so, you know, lots of reasons why we want to weave these um, discussions into the into our work in girls groups. And of course, not ever, you know, separating it from all the other important things that influence girls' health, um, like violence, um, sexual health, decision-making, the influence of the media on uh, girls' um, thinking and actions. So in other words, it's complex, and for that reason, I guess we really feel it's important to think about working um, from principle. Now, Barbella, maybe I'll stop for a second here and see if there are any questions you think we should um, answer at this point before we go on. Sure. So if anybody has any questions, they can click on the little Q&A icon in the top right and then just feel free to type anything. Um, and if not, then we can um, move on to the next section. Just so people know, we will post both a recording of this um, webinar and all the slides um, on our website um, so that you can access them after this and feel free to use them, et cetera. That is why we do this work. Um, and, um, you know, so if there are technical things about where can I get the links to some of the things um, we definitely um, will make all this available. Okay, so let's go on to think about these principles for practice, um, especially um, the uh, gender transformative ones that we promised to uh, speak to here. 
And um, this little diagram is one that Chazen and, and I and others at the center have been um, thinking about um, in a range of projects that we've been working on, um, on tobacco, on um, uh, gender and uh, substance use and opioids, et cetera. And we think that, you know, these four principles really have relevance um, within the context of the work in uh, girls' groups as well. And you'll see on the left-hand side there, we talk a little bit, quite a bit more about um, the gender transformative piece in a book that we've published called Making It Better, uh, Gender Transformative Health Promotion. And it's not focused on girls only, but, um, you know, there's a lot of information about gender transformative approaches on that website that's below those documents. Um, which is promoting health and women .ca. So you're welcome to um, explore that a bit more. And I'm going to talk a bit more um, now as we go through as well. But I think I'll start with um, the harm reduction oriented approach um, as a principle to deal with the complexities of discussing um, all these girls' health issues. Um, and I guess, you know, in the substance use area it's, um, and sexual health area, this harm reduction piece, I think, has really guided our work a lot in the last um, uh, decade. It's really being a lot about um, being pragmatic and being helpful to girls to um, open conversations. And, um, so, you know, oftentimes when we take, even though we know it's best for girls, especially since it's illegal, um, it's best for them not to be taking up alcohol um, and other substance use as um, girls before the legal age. Um, and certainly things like the low risk alcohol drinking guidelines um, do make that recommendation from um, the Canadian Center on Substance Use um, and Addiction. But, you know, that rather than taking that kind of abstinence only or zero tolerance approach, um, I think it's really important for us to support girls to think about safer substance use and safer sex and giving them information and resources, as um, we mentioned earlier, about their health. So it's not really a matter of us um, not promoting abstinence, because abstinence is certainly a choice. Um, but I think it's also about giving, helping girls learn and think through what their approach will be when they do decide to use, or if they're already using, um, really thinking about how can they be as safe as possible within that context. So, you know, it's a big change from our older versions of how we work with girls. And, you know, we've given some five key ideas of harm reduction that could be relevant to girls' uh, programming. So that you as facilitators are open to discussing the benefits and drawbacks of behaviors such as alcohol and cannabis use. And, um, you know, really explore how girls see they benefit from and um, being able to offer both benefits and drawbacks and giving girls the chance to discuss those pros and cons and to get feedback on um, what they're doing and what they might do. And really staying in this place of choices and options and incremental changes and small steps rather than saying, have you quit using tobacco completely, really helping girls break down steps um, for that um, so that they feel welcome to um, uh, get the kind of support um, that they need and really relying on their wisdom. So lots to think about in terms of a principle for practice in girls' uh, programming around harm reduction 
um, approaches, whether that be substance use or sexual health or a range of other um, issues, is really thinking about reducing harm and not taking stances that close conversations, but really open them to what uh, girls might see as uh, important. Now, we just released this, uh, these two documents at the Center of Excellence, I guess, two weeks ago. Um, they're on our website as well. But in terms of um, discussing substance use with girls, there's a lot of ways those discussions can focus on harm reduction and building skills and thinking about what your relationship to substance use is, your values, your decision making. And here's some of the ideas we've covered in, in those, like, getting home safely, managing stress, and thinking about alternatives to substance use if that's the reason you're using. And really giving space for uh, girls to hear about the short and long-term health effects of alcohol, such as the link with breast cancer. Um, and lots of ideas for how they might talk to parents and help um, um, about substance use and recognizing this is something that they've done a lot at BC uh, Children's Hospital, I know, is even putting out an infographic about the warning signs of alcohol poisoning and helping girls recognize that and stay with their friends and help them get help, um, et cetera. So you can see me, there are so many things that could be a way of informing, discussing, helping, uh, shifting the thinking from um, don't use substances to all, all this uh, type of complexity. So let's go to principle two and trauma informed, which is really a lot about recognizing how experiences of violence and trauma may affect girls' ability to access um, and participate in programming and feel safe to talk about what's important for them. And I think, you know, the most important part of our, our being aware doesn't mean that as facilitators we're trying to treat trauma in any way, but really that, um, that how um, girls' experiences may affect their ability to discuss what's going on with them and uh, feel comfortable in developing relationships in, um, in groups. And, you know, again, talking about what some of the impacts of trauma can be, we um, created this um, what are the effects of trauma poster at the Center of Excellence and really I think makes it a lot easier to see how wide ranging the effects of trauma can be and um, really giving a great um, bit of uh, discussion or uh, possibilities for girls to, um, to think about it. And really the essence of trauma-informed approaches is to focus on strengths rather than weaknesses. And, um, and in the health promotion field, you know, we haven't necessarily been that good at that. We've often talked about things we need to stop doing um, rather than focusing on the positive. And, um, you know, really thinking about how we provide tools for healthy relationships, how we build in uh, fun activities to girls' groups, um, and that, um, you know, how we focus on what's working for girls and how they can bring more of what's working for them in rather than um, really shaming them about the fact they're not meeting um, guidelines or, or recommendations. And I think, you know, it's, it's such an important piece of our work is um, being strength-based um, th throughout all of these um, ways of working. And, you know, the, the girls mentioned to us how important girls um, groups were in providing safe spaces. And I think for physical safety, emotional safety, cultural safety, I think there's lots we can do within the context of groups to girls groups to make a place where it really it feels safe. And um, and there's lots of things that facilitators can do to be to make 
you know, the group's trustworthy, predictable, um, you know, making uh, clear expectations, um, being consistent and providing options so girls, you know, can choose um, the amount of participation they're comfortable with um, rather than um, forcing that. And really, again, you know, so important as adults um, that we um, really model and support the development of skills to cope with trauma, like grounding skills and mindfulness, and bringing some of that in as a way of supporting girls, um, uh, you know, being able to cope with trauma and move forth in, in healthy ways. So lots in that, in that area as well. So if you're not already tired thinking about how you're holding up harm reduction and trauma-informed, I'm going to turn to these other two uh, principles of practice. And I think, you know, the gender transformative one, I think is a really important one um, that we've been doing so much thinking about at the center is how do we promote health and promote gender equity at the same time, rather than seeing these as um, sequential things, but really doing them together, multitasking in that sense. So, you know, I love this quote from, um, from the folks from the U.S. Um, around it, that gender transformative approaches actively strive to examine question and change rigid gender norms and imbalances of power as a means of reaching health as well as gender equity objectives. And I think, you know, there's so much work going on internationally on gender transformative work, actually a lot more internationally than actually is going on in uh, North America. And I think it's time for us to really think about how we um, do this um, gender transformative work and think about the benefits of questioning gender norms in the context of our work on health, prom health promotion. And, you know, um, lots of different ways of enacting that. But again, you know, avoiding the kind of messaging that reinforces gender stereotypes. Um, and, you know, so many of our, much of our health promotion work has been focused on that, around, you know, um, girls' appearances and really moving to an entirely different way of supporting um, health. I love the writing on the girl's body here. <laughs> Uh, paving your body as a really important way for us. Um, so, you know, I think that idea of, of empowerment around gender um, is, again, like the other two we've already mentioned, a lot about life skills, um, self-advocacy, doing critical media analysis. But also, as Girls Action really supports, is lots of work in community, getting involved in um, your community, looking at um, how um, change can happen beyond personal skills, and um, really finding ways to place power um, at knowledge as choice and opportunity, and putting it in girls' hands. And really the idea of leadership skills as being an incredibly important way forth um, that isn't narrowly focused on nutrition and alcohol and um, physical activity only, but is a lot about um, planning um, programming both as in girls groups but in the community um, at large and um, mentoring each other in that context. So already you can see these are not normal girl-focused things, but really things that are much more about equity and uh, change. And so some of the, you know, program activities we, we thought about in terms of 
to girls' empowerment and gender equity, the idea of media literacy, and there's lots of that in the resources we've created uh, so far. So really helping girls look at how gender stereotypes play out and beauty norms and advertising tactics and really being able to situate themselves as uh, separate from that. And again, really thinking lots about relationships and um, negotiating consent, um, engaging boys in girls' health issues, um, and really not making girls' health only the responsibility of girls, but of everyone and um, thinking a lot about gender-based violence and how we approach that from a place that isn't um, only up to girls to change. So lots of work on sexual health and gender norms, advocacy skills, girl-led community change projects, um, so many ways in which we might incorporate um, new thinking about gender and gender equity in, as a way of finding health, as opposed to something that's separate, that you do the personal skill development and then somewhere later you look at, at uh, larger leadership issues. But really think about it all the way through, embedding this idea of girls as leaders um, and as um, critical thinkers within the context of everything we do. And finally, just really wanting to mention how important it is always to be thinking about more than one determinant of health at a time and really um, acknowledging the importance of cultural safety woven into harm reduction, trauma-informed and gender transformative um, approaches as well. And, you know, something that originally came um, um, from some uh, folks in uh, New Zealand um, who were working in nursing and who really, you know, talked about the fact that culture is not something that other people have, but is actually something we all have and that the work in girls' groups and in other contexts is really a lot about creating an environment that's safe to um, discuss um, who we are um, culturally as well as um, who we are in um, terms of our health so that we can share knowledge across cultures and help people situate themselves um, in a kind of a learning context um, together. And, you know, there's been some great examples of cultural safety and health promotion. And if you haven't seen the Native Youth Sexual Health posters that are on the left-hand side, they're really, really um, out there and positive in, in terms of thinking about uh, an indigenous approach to um, sexual health issues. Um, and really causing us to think about um, how, we, how we talk about culture within the context of health promotion. And um, so lots of, lots of work can be um, done in girls' groups. And um, especially, you know, I think in, this, in that third point around that, navigating norms and expectations related to ideals of beauty and food cultures and family pressures and experiences of racism. And it becomes a really rich um, place to be, to see culture and exchange ideas um, about, um, about who we are in relationship um, to cultural practices. So lots to think about, I think, in terms of cultural safety. And um, this great um, diagram from Jessica Ball, who's at UVic here um, in Victoria, I think has really gives lots of great ideas about um, how, how that looks like in, um, in the process and as cultural identity as a 
resource and a strength for girls and creating space to talk about racism and including health knowledge from different cultures um, and, and bringing in elders and other uh, folks that are uh, wise people from different cultures, doing community visits, lots of ways in which to bring in cultural safety to this, uh, to this work. So, you know, I think we tried to boil down for you um, as best we could this idea of trauma-informed, harm reduction-oriented, gender transformative and culturally safe approaches to really get us all thinking. And it, all of these ideas are woven into um, the uh, manual, the workshop manual um, that um, Oh, well, the Girls Action Foundation will be releasing in the fall. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Marbella, to talk a little sure. bit about uh, girls-specific programming. And I don't know whether we have some questions we should answer before you do that. Oh, I've been keeping up with the questions throughout. So right. I think, oh, yeah, if people would like to ask any questions about the four principles that we just covered, you can feel free to type that into the Q&A. Great. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much, Nancy. So we'll just go to the next uh, slide here. Nancy? Yeah, I'm trying to get there, oh. sorry. <laughs> Locked on me there. There we go. There are. we go. <laughs> okay, so first I'd like to talk about the Girls Action Foundation approach. What's really important is that we have five principles through which all of our programs and, and everything are based off of. And that would be um, popular education or critical education, integrating a feminist analysis, creating gender specific spaces to be critically asset based and to enforce social action and change. So you'll find all of this throughout the toolkit with every resource and activity that we have planned out for you. Um, it's really important for Girls Action Foundation to use an empowerment framework and to make sure that we center the girls um, in the center of every activity and discussion, that it's not a hierarchical approach. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that when we expand on what popular education is. Just trying to turn it over here. There we, there we go. <laughs> okay, so as we mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, Amplify is, uh, some of you may know and may have actually participated in it, but it's an annual event that we usually hold here um, at Girls Action, uh, and it is a training for facilitators. So people who facilitate or work with girls groups are able to come and do a train the trainer um, weekend retreat intensive training where you can learn about the Girls Action approach and um, have lots of really informative resources and a toolkit is available that you can find on our website. Um, just a disclaimer, our website is going through a bit of a transition right now, so we are going to be um, releasing a, a brand new website, but the toolkit should still be available um, in the website's current state. Um, and in this workshop guide, you'll have a collection of over 50 activities from uh, girls programmers across the country. So it was created collaboratively um, by Girls Action and then also of several of our network members who are very, very important to the work that Girls Action does. Okay, so what is popular education? Um, popular education is basically centering the people that you're working with and using their stories to inform the work that you're doing, rather than coming in to the, the space, the workshop space or the facilitation space and assuming that you have all the answers and that you are the, the expert in everything, is letting their, um, their stories inform the direction um, and the topics that you will include um, so that everything is relevant and that they're able to take away as much as they can. Um, here we have a, a quote on the side that says, popular education is an educational approach that collectively and critically examines everyday experiences and raises consciousness for organizing and movement, building, building, acting on injustices with a political vision in the interests of the most marginalized. So um, on the next slide, we have a very um, 
a very helpful uh, diagram, which is the, I think it's the next slide, yes, it's the popular education and the spiral model. So if you look at this drawing on the left, it shows it doesn't necessarily have to go in order, but it is really important to um, really consider each principle when you're creating your programs or when you're facilitating a popular education program. So at the core of it is the people's experience, and then you look for patterns within those experiences, and um, once you have that context, that is when you add the new information in theory, um, which then leads to pra um, including practice skills, strategizing and planning for action, and then applying the action, so seeing the change in motion. Um, yes, okay. So what is the role of the facilitator if it's not to be, um, you know, the teacher at the front of the classroom? Um, it's important as a facilitator to make sure that you remember you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to have all of the answers. Your role is to keep the space safe and to provide guidance for everybody that's participating, um, especially given a lot of the information that is going to be released in this toolkit. We're not expecting every single facilitator to suddenly overnight become an expert in health promotion and on all of these issues, a lot of the information that you need will be included in the toolkit, um, and it's really important. Oh, sorry, I'm getting some feedback on my phone. Okay, <laughs> so it's really important for you as a facilitator um, to provide that safe space and to guide the participants. So it's important for you to let girls lead. So the girls are the leaders and the creators of the space and of the content, and you are there to support them. It's important to look at their interests and concerns as your inspiration, um, and then that way everything is relevant to what is actually happening um, in their communities around them. Um, and then also they are engaged and interested in the work that they're doing. Um, this way they're, they're not disconnected and they're less likely to be apathetic about the workshop or the content that's being shared. Um, it's important to let go of preconceived outcomes. Often with health promotion, we get really tied up in the curriculum or in needing to get all of the information out all at once, but it's really important to let the girls feel empowered to share their ideas and for you to provide, you know, um, space for them to do that. Um, so give them the space for, the, for them to explore, to use their unique voices and problem solving activities, uh, sorry, abilities, as opposed to leading them into doing what you think that they should do. Um, and it's also very important to remember that learning goes both ways. Um, be humble about what you do and don't know, and be open to what you can learn. So you have a lot to learn from the girls that are in your programs. They have a lot to share with you, to tell you about their lives, what's going on in their communities, um, what their experiences are, and that should um, inform the way that you build your program and the way that you um, facilitate your workshop. Okay, so in practice, how do you integrate physical activity? I think it can be a little bit daunting for people who don't identify as, as athletic to integrate uh, physical activity into their girls' groups. But I think that it is um, can be a lot less intimidating and a lot easier than you think. So it can be as easy as integrating active games. Uh, in the toolkit, we have a lot of games and icebreakers, teaching kids that activities can be, you know, walking instead of taking transit or as accessible as going on YouTube. Um, or sharing with your friends about what their favorite activities are to do. Um, it's, will, it's really important for you to keep an open mind and to be willing to throw yourself into new experiences to show the girls that they don't have to be intimidated by physical activity or they don't have to be a professional athlete um, or, you know, quote-unquote super fit or look the way that an athlete looks. Traditionally, we also have a lot of critical media literacy um, examples of workshops in the toolkit that will help them understand, you know, that sports and activity isn't limiting and that there are several ways that they can integrate it into their lives. Okay, so here are some ideas from health promotion pro programming. Um, the Amplify manual that I talked about includes workshops on body image and self-esteem, healthy relationships, safer sex, sexuality, and gender identity. Um, as Nancy mentioned, we created a, a few resources that are available that have some information and discussion guides on alcohol and depression, smoking and stress, physical activity and culture. And in the fall, um, as we've mentioned, this health and wellness curriculum will be released, and this will enjoy joyful movement, food and nutrition, and substance use, and a lot more as well. 
So, you know, I think it's really neat um, uh, to have worked with Girls Action over the past few years in looking at what the literature says is um, a good idea around health promotion and also what the experience of, you know, the groups have been, Marbella, as they, mm -hmm. you know, worked with using the Amplify um, model. And um, I just think it's kind of um, an interesting um, alliance between our two organizations as we think through um, these um, various uh, things and try and make them practical for um, um, for uh, girls um, programming. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, you know, the Amplify kit has been so useful to people in terms of laying out the spiral model kind of ideas, as you, as you say. And the challenges, I guess, have been as we've worked together over the time is a little bit more on how do you integrate the health promotion part into it and give facilitators lots of ideas about health promotion without, as you say, them suddenly thinking they have to deliver, you know, specific sessions on, mm -hmm. um, on different health topics, but are able to pick up on the, the cues that girls are raising and offer, say, well, you know, let's, let's look at this website or let's think about um, who's doing what in our community that we might be able to explore as a group to really, um, you know, change the model from being, um, you know, a luxury kind of thing about health to be much more of a curiosity-driven one and a, and a safe one. So, I, you know, I think it's going to be really um, fun to see um, this new curriculum and um, give girls group facilitators even more ideas about than the ones that are already existing in the Amplify Manual. And I don't know whether there's anything from um, the new curriculum that you can think of that um, is particularly um, new for you? Um, off the top of my head, I, uh, I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, sorry, I've been staring at the curriculum doing the revisions and the edits on this 90-page uh, this toolkit. <laughs> so yep. um, I'm a little bit cross-eyed right now, but um, there is a, a, a lot of information that I think will be very useful to, to girls programmers of all types across the country. So. Mm -hmm. I think girls, there's been a lot more written about trauma-informed yoga and different uh, movement-oriented things, and I think that could be really helpful. I know if, if I were a girls' group facilitator, as you say, you know, not being terribly athletic, um, mm -hmm. that might be the, one of the biggest challenges for me is how to weave that piece in. And I, I think it's interesting that you know you mentioned joyful movement there as a... Mm -hmm. <laughs> As, as something that's in the new manual. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And you've come from the food nutrition side of things, from formerly working on eating disorders issues, et cetera. Um, yes. And I think that's another area that's kind of really challenging to think about, especially when girls may not be coming from really wealthy families and trying to think about how do we work on, um, uh, you know, uh, access to healthy food that isn't necessarily expensive. And I'm not sure what all is in the new guide around food and nutrition, but I assume that there's some place there for people to be thinking about um, mm -hmm. community kitchens and other ways of enjoying um, cooking together, et cetera. Definitely, yes. So um, like you said, um, 
I, I come from uh, the eating disorder background. I used to be an advisor on this toolkit when I worked for the National Eating Disorder Information Center. And so that was something that uh, we really kept in mind when we were working on the food and nutrition section, was to make sure that we were coming at it from a non-diet-centered and a body-positive lens. Um, and also to refer back to what you were saying about cultural safety, that when we talk about food and nutrition, there are workshops and information on identifying you know, structural inequalities um, within access to food and how that might impact um, somebody's ability or empowerment to be able to make um, what we consider to be healthy choices. So I think there's a lot of really interesting information that will be helpful for people from all socioeconomic backgrounds, working with girls who are living in either urban or rural centers. Um, and I think that what we really try to do is to come from an anti-oppressive lens so that the girls never feel shamed or guilty about the choices that they're able to make, but instead are able to be empowered um, from where they are or from where they are socially located. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, eh? And I know that the center has helped with a few discussion questions around substance use um, mm -hmm. for the new manual, and I think that's a really interesting place of navigation um, because, you know, of course, we don't want to think about girls as um, using substances when they're um, below legal age. However, we also know that many are. So, you know, how do we create that idea of um, discussions and refusal skills and critical thinking on substances, um, et cetera? So I know that there's some really great ideas in the new manual um, about that as well. And, um, you know, I hope that the people who are listening on online today and others who may hear it later will also um, comment for us about um, that that part of it is, um, which is so challenging of, um, you know, knowing that the gold standard is not to use, but also being able to create safe environments to be able to, um, to talk about um, uh, safe use and um, health effects, et cetera, in ways that don't um, make it feel like um, some kind of a class uh, on substitute that's abstinence oriented only. So I think it's I think it's really, really important that strategic work um, that we're talking about here, and to come back to the gender transformative side of it, I think all of this is so great to be able to um, ask girls throughout, you know, how does this different for boys and for girls? And, you know, what are the kind of norms that you see that are not working for girls and for boys? And how do we, um, how do we shift that to be something that truly is promoting equity at the same time as health and seeing equity as a way to health. And um, I think that's um, a really um, new way forward for us to be incorporating in, in all that we do. Now, I don't know whether you've seen any other questions or whether we want to um, wrap this up at this point. Yeah, I think um, I have left everybody my email address, which is uh, available also, should be available through the Girls Action website. But if anybody, you know, after the fact realizes they, they didn't ask anything that they really wanted to have addressed, then they can feel free to reach out to us. Um, Thank you so much, Nancy, for for your presentation and for informing all of us today. And uh, thank you, yeah. everybody, for joining us. Um, and like we mentioned, we're going to be sending the recording and a PDF of the slides to all of the um, the registrants and people who have joined us. So. That's great. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone.